So, we've now got a brief introduction to ecosystem services, probably all things that you've heard about before, and this, this little segment will also be probably things you've heard before. Uh, but we're basically just getting everybody onto the same page and everybody up to a basic understanding so that we can jump into detail in the next couple days, okay? Um, so we wanted to talk about this idea of essential biodiversity variables. Um, cho we choose those words very carefully because it's, it's referring to a specific list of variables um, that have been proposed. So we're not just saying, well, what might the essential biodiversity variables be? We're talking about the essential biodiversity variables. And what you're gonna see in the course of this course is that we're gonna talk about this list of variables critically. Okay, we're gonna think about, do they make sense as the essential biodiversity variables? So, this is one of those, those bridges between science and policy. Uh, there is this uh, GEOBON, it's the Group on Earth Observations, um, and they, they have kind of developed this concept of essential biodiversity variables. EBVs are the abbreviation for essential biodiversity variables. These variables defined as the derived measurements required to study, report, and manage biodiversity change, focusing on status and trends in elements of biodiversity, should play the role of brokers between monitoring initiatives and decision makers. They provide the first level of abstraction between low-level primary observations and high-level indicators of biodiversity. Okay, so there's a lot to digest in that statement. The main thing that they're saying is what I would call primary biodiversity data. You know, some, something like, I saw this species at this place at this time. Right, that's a primary unit of data for one element, one dimension of biodiversity. What they're saying is what we talked about yesterday, that those data, you can't you know, go to the Minister of the Environment here in Rwanda and say, look, here's 10 million primary biodiversity records for Rwanda. Because he'll be like, so? Right? And that's because he's in a policy world. Whereas we're in a science world, okay? And so they're right that there needs to be some level of synthesis, they call it abstraction. Um, I kind of don't like the loaded terms low level and high level. That, you know, I understand high hierarchically, but I kind of don't like that. But that's just me. Um, but the measurements required to study, report, and manage biodiversity change. That's big. Manage. Okay? So, you know, essentially, if the EBVs are good, then we don't need to do that course on bridging between uh, science and policy. It's done by these EBVs. I think you can get from the tone of my voice that I'm not convinced. But let's talk about it, and there are useful things in here. So out of the Geobon effort came this paper in science, led by Pereira, uh, Essential Biodiversity Variables. Um, essentially what they're saying is, I already told you, the first level of abstraction between primary observations and you know, more important, broader things. They should be able to capture critical scales and dimensions of biodiversity. They should be biological. They should be a state variable. They should be sensitive to change. This is an interesting one. They should be ecosystem agnostic. A little bit 
complex in terms of language, but what it means is you should be able to measure these things and the measurements aren't specific to one particular ecosystem. So you should get the same measurement and the same units no matter if you're in savanna or desert or forest, right? And they should be technically feasible, economically viable, and sustainable in time. And that's a point that we're going to come back to a bunch of times. I think, you'll, I think you'll see that there's some really scary contrasts amongst the EBVs. But this is the concept that you had these low-level primary observations, and you can see they call it in-situ monitoring, but let's call it primary biodiversity records. This species at this place at this time. And also in the primary observations they include remote sensing. And we're going to get into some of the remote sensing this week. And so those primary ob observations feed up into the higher level abstractions of the EBVs. And we'll, I'll show you tables of this, but species traits, species populations, genetic composition, community composition, ecosystem structure, ecosystem function. Just, just to get a little discussion going, when we use remote sensing tools, which of those can we see? You have a satellite, you have Landsat, right? Or you have the MODIS sensor. Those, those sensors are looking down at the Earth, and what information comes into them? Distribution. Well, no, what, literally what information comes in? What comes into them is the electromagnetic spectrum. And so it might be all blue or all red or some mixture, right? And then I think Ben's gonna show us some LIDAR data. And that is, you're sending a signal down and you're looking at how quickly it bounces back. So a desert and a forest are gonna be pretty different. So I can see LIDAR data, data telling us a huge amount about ecosystem structure. And from some of the, um, the more customary remote sensing products, we can definitely get some measures that are related to ecosystem function. You've all seen maps of net primary productivity for the whole Earth. So imagine I say to you, here's $50 billion, right? All the money in the universe that you could want. Get me world maps of those six EBVs. Right? You have six things to do. With all that money, you can hire 50 people per EBV. Well, this one, you just give Ben a ton of money to fly LIDAR sensors around the Earth, <laughs> and he'll give you that map. In fact, it's already kind of been mapped for the whole Earth. And you give Amelie a ton of money, and she can give you nice maps of productivity and, and, and things like that. And so, you know, you've got your $50 billion checklist, and you go, check, check. Now do the other four. How many of you have been on biodiversity inventory efforts? Go out to this natural area and come back with a list of all of the plants of that place. Yeah? Or all of the amphibians, or all of the reptiles, or whatever. Were you done? No. How many places did you do in a month? Okay. So all, we're going to talk about this a lot this week. There are real market differences in feasibility for these different variables. And remember, it said technically feasible and economically viable. I was once on a, on a kind of advisory committee for a thing called the All Species Foundation. And this was Silicon Valley, you know, our rich, uh, technology people 
And some of them approached some biologists and said, we think this biodiversity thing is really cool. If we could get a billion dollars for you, a, a thousand million dollars, could you finish the catalog of life on Earth? And it was a really neat conversation. But then the economy collapsed the next year, and so we stopped talking about a billion dollars. But technically feasible, economically viable, and sustainable in time. Can you do that with these other things? I want you to think about that in the course of what we talk about. Remember, this comes after the ecosystem services, but they kind of meld together. You're gonna to see a lot of the, the remote sensing stuff under the rubric of, of ecosystem services. So just to give you a little more detail, here are those same six. And so if we want to talk about species traits, we're talking about phenology, morphology, reproduction, physiology, movement. If we want to talk about species populations, we're talking about distribution, abundance, population structure, genetic composition, co-ancestry, so that's phylogeny, allelic diversity, population to population differentiation, diversity of breeds and varieties, community composition, we're talking about taxonomic diversity, essentially how many species are there, and then how do they interact. Ecosystem function, productivity, nutrient retention, disturbance regimes, ecosystem structure, habitat structure, ecosystem extent and fragmentation, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get a little bit more detail. So here are those same EBVs. They give examples, types of measurements, and how they might be scalable which is to say how you might be able to build it out to being a world map, how feasible they are, and here's the policy bridge, their relevance to CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, targets. And so in that policy world, all you have to say is target 12. And everybody knows what you're talking about. The rest of us have to go on the web and figure out what target 12 or target 10 was. Um, so this just kind of fleshes out the, the, what they are defining as um, these essential biodiversity variables. Now, what they are really aiming at is to have an essential set of biodiversity variables just the way the IPCC has a set of essential fields for climate and climate change. And so you can go to the IPCC page and they have this wonderful data distribution center <clears throat> and it's really cool because what they've done is they've gotten many of the different climate modeling institutions around the world to tune their climate models to the same set of input conditions. And then you see how these different models run under exactly the same conditions. And you can download, they really, there wasn't really a good place to get a screen capture, but you can download the raw data, the synthesized data, the monthly syntheses, the decade syntheses. And you can just say, I want this model, this model, this model, this model. And you're getting all of these essential climate variables. So if you go to the Geobun um, Data Distribution Center that's intended to be just like the IPCC, you can get maps like this. Forest cover. Global forest cover loss, 
Data in this layer were generated using multispectral satellite imagery from the Landsight 7 thematic mapper. Uh, over 600,000 images were analyzed. Um, and this is, I believe, 20, 2001 to 2012. And what you're seeing is pixels where there has been change in global forest cover. I'm not defending this, okay? I'm just putting it out there. You know, it looks like Ethiopia is doing pretty well and Somalia has, hasn't had any forest loss whatsoever. Okay, I'm just saying, now I'm gonna show you something really ridiculous, bordering on just plain stupid. Okay, here's another one that I found. I hadn't been to this page. Changes in local bird diversity. I'm an ornithologist, so this, this comes close to home. EBV, alpha diversity. Species, uh, it's actually not on their list of EBVs, but changes in bird diversity at the grid cell level caused by land use, estimated by the CSAR model. It reports changes in species number relative to the year 1900 for all bird species, and then there are also products for forest bird species and non-forest bird species. It uses the LUH 2.0 projections for land use and the predicts coefficients for bird affinities to land uses. There's so much to unpack in this one that I probably should just shut up, but I'm not going to. Many of these sites around the tropical world, we don't know what the bird species composition was in 1900. We don't know. And so we're using these kind of half-baked measures. Clearly what they've done is they have maps for each species, which are outline maps drawn, you know, like this. None of the detail that that real distributions have. And then clearly for each of those species, they have some list of habitat types, you know. Closed forest, yes. Savanna, no. Shrubland, yes. Like that. And then they have, um, they have these projections for land use. Again, it looks like it's 1910 to 2015. And so they're basically saying, okay, within species 322's range, these five pixels turned on and these two pixels turned off. And then they sum that up and they get this, this map for the whole world. I haven't read the paper. They published the map, so they ought, the map ought to be believable. but. I can tell you as an ornithologist, this is impossible to test, and it is bordering on irresponsible to publish. Anyhow, my point is simply, this is the sort of thing that that same minister of the environment that you gave, what was it, 10 million data points to, this is the sort of thing they want obviously zoomed into Rwanda or to whichever country. But this is what they want. They want that abstraction. They want that synthesis. They want to say, look, here it's gone to hell and here it's fine. Okay? So the question is, are these the right abstractions? And the question is, can we build abstractions that are responsible enough so as to be useful? Maybe we come back to those questions at the end of the course. So there's the list again. And then just to kind of go through what we're going to do in the two weeks of this course, we're going to First, talk about ecosystem services. You heard about that from Amelie. And then in the essential biodiversity variables part, we'll review each of them in quite a bit more detail and we'll discuss how each one of them is measured 
and what resources are there, you know, what data exists, what low-level primary data exists. We'll have hands-on practice with one of them. We're going to go pretty deep in, into community composition. And then we're, as you've probably guessed, we're going to look at this concept critically and we're going to ask, you know, kind of what are its strengths and weaknesses. I just have a uh, question which comes uh, when I look at all this biodiversity information and policy at times. Does it mean that we have to give economic value to virtually all the species that we can lay our hands on? And then the second is natural resources become. So some things that are not right now seen as resources, some species, something happens within our technology, within our awareness, and it becomes top on the tree. Mm -hmm. So how do we account for those kind of things? Good, good questions. Um, the first one is a really interesting one. That of, do you have to put essentially an economic valuation on, on all this stuff that we do? And when we talk about ecosystem services, there were the ones you, that you couldn't put a dollar value on easily. And then there were ones, you know, how much is green space worth to me? You know, it probably has public health consequences, right? And so you could measure the value of that but it also just has aesthetics. You know, I'm a lot happier seeing green out there than gray, even if it's just you know, some, some non-native plants. So we get into this challenge of valuation. Yes. I, I had a bit of my life spent talking with a serious um, ecological economist. And we had a bunch of debates about this, and it's a really interesting question, because economic value is based on how much it costs to replace it. And so, you know, I have an insurance policy on my house, okay? And if my house burns down tonight, there, with a certain amount of money, you could rebuild exactly the same house. Right? Or, you know, my car. It's worth this amount of money because I could go out and buy exactly the same make and model and condition with exactly the same number of kilometers on it. And I know how much that costs. And if I go out and convert a forest into, uh, into a parking lot, I know how much that amount of carbon storage costs. Pretty much. But I very quickly get off into other ecosystem services where it's harder to value them. But here's the interesting part. What would happen if the Louvre were to burn and the Mona Lisa was lost? One little painting of a woman. Very famous painting. Sorry, I didn't, I know you're French, Amelie, that might have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything can happen. Um, but what happens if the Mona Lisa is lost? What's its value? There is no amount of money that can recreate that painting. Even in your house, the photos of your children. Uh, that's true. Maybe, maybe we managed to get all the you know, the, the personally important stuff out before it burns down. But what do you do when something is irreplaceable? And guess what? All of these species that we talk about, yes. you know, we talk about species diversity as one of those, those uh, essential biodiversity variables. And so you can imagine a particular forest having the number 3,248. All of those 3,248 are not the same. So we could clearly recover a forest to having 3,248 species. They wouldn't be the same. They wouldn't have the same functions. And worse yet, what if you lose a species entirely? You know, species are the product of thousands to millions of years of independent evolution. 
they are impossible to reproduce. And so it's really interesting because you could say, well, the Mona Lisa is unbelievably valuable, and yet an economist would say it has no value. And unfortunately, you can say the th same thing about species, because species are irreplaceable. So you lose, you know, mountain gorilla, or, you know, beetle number 3580, that can never be replaced. So does it have a value? Did that incur a loss? Or should we not be trying to use economic metrics to talk about things that are irreplaceable? We should be using the biological metrics. Or maybe we should just say that there are things that have intrinsic value. Not economic value, but our existence is damaged with each species that is lost. But that's a hard argument to make to... Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, I've spoken ill of ecosystem services, but they have been and they can be a wonderful tool when used right and when interpreted right for justifying to a policymaker why that forest or why that savanna or whatever should be preserved. Right? You can say not only does it have the biodiversity value, but it also does this and this and this and this that would otherwise cost you this amount of money. Did I get bo to both of your questions or did I get lost? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if there is an example of any country institution that is making good use of these uh, essential biodiversity va variables and okay. if we could so I'll, I'll repeat the question and instructors we should try to repeat questions always is there an example of a country or a region that's using these essential biodiversity variables well and constructively well the concept is quite new I think that science paper I want to say it's 2018 it was published um, so in the sense of the essential biodiversity variables not yet um, but there are some countries that are making very good use of um, abstractions of low-level, I'm using their language, extractions of low-level observational data to create policy-relevant products. Um, let's see, the, the examples that would be highest on one's list would be Mexico, South Africa, Colombia, those are the three I'll, I'll, I'll list, but I'm sure I've forgotten some. Go to the Conabio website, C-O-N-A-B-I-O, -O, Conabio. Um, it's part of the Mexican government. Um, it's been around for 25 years-ish and uh, has accumulated vast resources of primary biodiversity data. They did that by becoming a funding agency. So uh, you know, they, they announced, we're making available um, funding for biodiversity studies that will result in data sets. And we'll have a lot of funds. But one of the requirements is, if you accept our funding, your data will become part of our mega data set. And more and more that has now become open access. So everybody has access to those data. Um, but they have accumulated amazing data resources for Mexican biotas. And because they're within the government, they have a very unique role. So for example, if some commercial enterprise wants to plant a genetically modified variety of cotton, in northern Mexico. There are permits for using those biological entities, that, that genetically modified cotton. Well, the permitting goes through Conabio. And Conabio is asked, well, what biodiversity entities could be damaged by a genetically modified cotton 
planted in these regions. And Conabio gives a report. And sometimes it is, this would be catastrophic. And other times it's, we don't see any problem. You know, they've had to be objective. But, you know, to give an example, Mexico is the, the home of the origin of corn. So corn is Zia mais, and there is Zia diploperennis, which is a diploid corn relative from which the haploid corn that we all eat was derived. And so there was a huge controversy in Mexico about whether genetically modified corn genes had leaked into this diploid corn relative. And it, it was quite a controversy. But the neat thing is, is they have the information to be able to do these analyses. So, yeah, there are examples. You know, I'd say Mexico's um, Conabio would be perhaps the biggest and best established. Uh, South Africa has done quite a bit. Um, so, you know, look at those examples, look at their websites, and you'll see some, some pretty impressive power of having information, not necessarily the essential biodiversity variables. Other questions? <laughs>